Take your Bible this evening, if you would, for our scripture reading to 1 Peter chapter 3, please. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3, we're going to read verses 8 through 12. Verses 8 through 12 of 1 Peter chapter 3, and we'll read the verses responsibly as we normally do, begin together on verse 8, and I'll read 9 and alternating till we end together on verse number 12 of 1 Peter chapter 3. As our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 3. Ready? Finally... Be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. And let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing now upon the reading of the scripture tonight and lord once again we ask that you would make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word this evening lord thank you for the wonderful music we've enjoyed again this evening and for the uh, singing of the people of god and lord we pray you'll bless the special now as it's sung and that you'll tune our hearts to your heart tonight and you'll help us to focus and uh, give you our undivided attention as we look into your word in a few moments in jesus name amen Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer and we ask your blessing upon our time in your word this evening. Lord, we pray that 
you will help us as we look into your word. I pray you'll help me as I bring the message and please help each listener as they listen tonight, whether here in the service or by way of the live stream. I pray, Lord, that each of us would concentrate and we'd give you our undivided attention and that once again the Spirit of God through the Word of God would speak to our hearts. Give us all ears to hear what you would say to us this evening. And I'll thank you for it, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was growing up, the biggest name in boxing was that of Muhammad Ali. He uh, might have been the greatest boxer of all time. If you ask him, he was. Some of you who remember that would, would know that he was the greatest. Um, of course, he was famous and maybe the most famous athlete of his generation. When he got older, he was struck with Parkinson's disease. And I remember hearing him with very halting speech and very trembling movement say, I had the world and it wasn't nothing. Here's a man who had everything that people look at and think that they want to have to be happy. And he said, I had it and it wasn't nothing. What makes a person love life? Is it wealth? A lot of people, I have occasion, as you do sometimes, to go into a gas station and get a drink, or uh, I, I get iced tea, or whatever you get, and you know, it's not unusual to see somebody, somebody uh, looking over the lotto tickets, trying to decide what one they want to play, or how many they want to buy. They think wealth may give them happiness. John Rockefeller the millionaire said, I've made many millions, but they brought me no happiness. I would barter them all for the days I sat in an office stool in Cleveland and counted myself rich on $3 a week. W.H. Vanderbilt of the Vanderbilt University said, The care of $200 million is too great a load for any brain or back to bear. It is enough to kill anyone. There's no pleasure in it. Henry Ford, the automobile king, said work is the only pleasure. It is only work that keeps me alive and makes life worth living. I was happier when doing a mechanic's job. Andrew Carnegie, the multimillionaire, said millionaires seldom smile. A recent survey found 20%, only 20% of Americans could say they were truly happy with their life. That's an amazing thing. And that's, that's not, and by the way, we have more in America to be happy about than 95% of the world. And yet most Americans would say they're not really happy. I, I think I might go further than that, and I think if we surveyed most Christians, they would have similar answers. So are you really loving your life? There's, there's very few that would say, man, I'm really loving life. In other words, uh, listen, uh, Jesus said that I've come that you might have life and you might have it more abundantly. And yet most of us, most believers are missing out on really loving life. We're kind of like the fella, little boy who lived far out in the country. It was the late 1800s. And he had gotten to be 12 years of age and has never in his whole life had seen a circus. And so he was excited when a poster went up in town announcing that next Saturday a traveling circus was coming to town. He ran home with the glad news and said, Daddy, can I go? And though the family was pretty poor, the father sensed how important it was to his son. And so he said, if you do your Saturday chores ahead of time, I'll see to it that you have the money to go. Well, Saturday morning came, the chores were all done, and the little boy stood right by the breakfast table, dressed in his Sunday best. And the father reached down into his pocket of his overalls and pulled out a dollar bill. The most money at that time that little boy had ever possessed in his whole life. He was so excited, his feet hardly seemed to touch the ground while he made his way to town. 
As he got near the outskirts of the town, he noticed people were lining up on the street. He worked his way through the crowd till he could see what was happening, and behold, what he saw unfolding before him was a circus parade. The circus was coming to town. The parade was the grandest thing he'd ever seen in his life. Caged animals snarled as they passed. Bands beat their rhythms and sounded their horns and midgets performed acrobatics. White flags and ribbons swirled. Finally, after everything had passed and uh, uh, where he was standing, the traditional circus clown came by with floppy shoes and baggy pants and a brightly painted face. And as the clown passed by, the little boy reached into his pocket and handed the clown the precious dollar bill. And then turned around, and went home. What happened? The boy thought he'd seen the circus when all he saw was the parade. That's a lot of, like how a lot of people go through life. We're missing what really God has for us. We're missing out on the main event. We're missing out on the exciting journey and the marvelous adventure that God has for us called life. We tend to, be, we tend to just settle back and, and, and think, well, this is just the way it's supposed to be. I'm just not supposed to be very happy, or I'm just not supposed to have much, or I'm just not supposed to be this, or I'm just not supposed to do that, and it's just my life, and that's the way it is, and I'll just have to be this way, and I'll endure it, and uh, I'll, I'll have to be miserable, but God just wants me to be a little bit miserable. And people live that way. Do you have the abundant life Jesus promised? Do you want the abundant life that Jesus promised? In 1 Peter chapter 3, the passage we read this evening is actually not only in the New Testament, it's found in the Old Testament as well in the book of Psalms. But it's really interesting that how he places this here, and I, I won't, I'm not going that direction this evening, but it is, it's, it's always interesting in the Bible to not just look at the verses, but to look at where the verses are placed in the Bible. Here when he talks about loving life in verse number 10, he that will love life and see good days comes right after he deals in the first seven verses with a wife who's living with an unsaved husband. And right on the verse, right on the end of wives living with an unsaved husband, and then gives instructions, by the way, to the husband about dwelling with the wife according to knowledge and honoring her and being heirs together of the grace of life that your prayers be not hindered. He says, Finally, be ye one mind, have compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous. Now remember, he's talking to wives and husbands. Isn't that interesting? A lot of times we look at those verses and we think, well, that's for me with everybody else. No, that's for you where you live. That's for you at home. That's for those who are you and those who are closest to you. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing there unto where you called you should inherit a blessing. Now, he said, if you'll live that way at home, and, and you, you know, despite your circumstances, despite uh, your, your situation, he says, you live this way, you want to love life, and you want to see some good days, remember the context that he's talking about, then he lays out what we're supposed to do. Isn't it great God tells us how to have a good life? Isn't it great that God tells us how we can love life? Here it is. Let's see what he says. Number one, he said, if you're going to love life and see good days, number one, let him refrain his tongue from evil. The first thing God says I need you to do, if you're going to love life and you're going to see some good days, you better control your tongue. The, the whole issue of whether you're going to enjoy life or not, or love life or not, is going to start right there. With what comes out of your mouth. Keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from speaking guile. Guile is deceit. Are, are double meaning, crafty words. The mark of maturity in the Christian life is the ability to control your tongue. James says the one who controls his tongue the same as a perfect man, a mature man, able to control the whole body. 
It's when you can say something evil, but you do not. Evil is something that would harm somebody else. When you read about Joseph's brothers, they came back to their father, and it says when they talked about Joseph, they brought him the evil report. Why was it an evil report? Because they were putting Joseph in a bad light. It was intended to bring harm and hurt to Joseph. When you speak, always evil. I bought a Bible study on that. I don't know if some of you remember it or not. The difference between sin and evil. And, and listen, the, the evil has to do with our speech. When we intend to bring harm to someone else. Titus 3, verse 2, Speak evil of no man. Don't use your tongue to try to cut somebody up. Don't use your tongue to try to destroy someone else. Or to speak according to the book of Ephesians, that which builds others up, not tears them down. It's when you can say something evil, but you do not. Someone said the tongue of slander slays three people. The speaker, the spoken to, and the one spoken of. It always kills three people. Always ask yourself, is what I'm about to say, is it true? Is it kind? And is it necessary? And you, you never have to eat the words you do not say. So guard your tongue. Control your tongue. Most in the, the Bible says in the book of Proverbs, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. The more we say, the more we're likely to say something wrong. Something that would harm somebody else. So control our tongue. But he goes on. Notice he says, not only will you see, love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil, and his lips they speak no guile, let him eschew evil. That means, number two, you stay away from evil. Eschew it. It, it means you flee evil. You get away from it. Evil, evil's everywhere. What is evil? People saying things to try to harm other people or hurt other people or tear other people down. That's everywhere. I dare say, those of you who go to work tomorrow, you won't be at work very long though someone's going to try to say something about somebody else and put them in a bad light. I, I've never been on a job yet where I haven't uh, been around in a break room or around other guys and, and they want to say something bad about the management. Place isn't run right. They should be doing this. They should be doing that. Everybody wanting to complain about how it's run. Evil is everywhere. And you know, evil is trying to overcome us. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. That means evil's trying to overcome me. It's trying to take over me. It's trying to take over you. But you overcome evil with good. And evil is always associated with our tongue. When we seek to hurt someone or tear somebody down, God says that is evil. In 1 Corinthians 13, the charity chapter, the Bible says something interesting about charity. It says, charity thinketh no what? Evil. Charity thinketh no evil. Charity is not apt to be suspicious of others. Charity keeps no ledgers of wrongdoing. Suspicious happenings. Charity is reluctant to believe ill about somebody else. Charity will not easily believe bad reports. Charity will not make the worst conclusions. Charity will always put the best face on the circumstances. When, we, when the Lord taught the model prayer, lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver me from wanting to speak in such a way it would harm somebody else. And Lord, 
keep me from that temptation. That I won't fall into that trap. It's easy to fall into. Boy, it's quiet in here tonight. All the water in the world, however hard it tried, could never sink a ship unless it got inside. And all the evil in the world that's wicked and that's sinful can never sink your soul's fair ship unless you let it in. Do you eschew evil? Can I remind you, my friend, that not only does a... Can, can we... We're just as guilty if we give the listening ear to the tongue that speaks evil as if our tongue speaks evil itself. And you have to be willing to eschew it, run away from it, get away from it, flee it. Don't be partake of that. You don't have to, but you're not going to love life. You're not going to see good days. If you want to love life and you want to see good days, then you have to control your tongue and you have to eschew that which is evil. It all has to do with what you say. Then, it all follows right along. If you, if you follow it along, not only do you eschew evil, what's the next thing he says we're supposed to do? Do good, verse 11. I refrain, I control my tongue, I eschew evil, and I do good. When I do good, I'm going 180 degrees away from evil. Jesus, or God told Adam and Eve in the garden, you need all the trees of the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What's the opposite of evil? Good. That means I don't just want to not do what's wrong. I want to do what's good. The Christian life isn't just not doing what's wrong. Well, I don't do that, I don't do that, I don't do that. Well, what are you doing good? You don't do wrong so you can do good. It's amazing that we have to tell us to do good, huh? It's doing what is good in God's sight. James 1 and verse number 25. You're in 1 Peter. You're not far from James. Just turn to your left and you'll find the book of James chapter 1. Notice, James is the one who tells us to be doers of the Word and not hearers only. Notice verse number 25 with me, will you please? James 1, verse 25. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed. What's the word blessed in the Bible mean? Happy. This man will be happy in his deed. He's happy because he's doing what he knows is good to do and what's right to do. There's a great verse in uh, Acts chapter 10. Would you look there with me please? Acts 10 is Peter uh, speaking to Cornelius and to those who Cornelius has gathered to hear the message from God from Peter. Notice with me verse 37 of Acts chapter 10. That word I say ye know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about, what church? Doing good, and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. Here's Peter. Hey, arguably of the inner circle. The three that were closest to Jesus, who, who knew Him the best while He was on earth. Spent the most time with Him while He was on earth. Peter, sum up his life. Peter, tell us about Jesus of Nazareth. He says, you know what I'll tell you? He went about doing good. He went about doing good. Say, well, I'm just supposed to go around doing good? Yeah. Yeah, that's a start. Right there. If that's what Jesus did, that's what you and I can do. Just go about doing good. You overcome evil with good. You see, doing good people are happy people. People, people who know the Bible aren't happy people. People who obey the Bible are happy people. You're not happy. Jesus said if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. 
It's the most miserable people are people who know what the Bible says and they don't do it. Why? Because to him that knoweth to do good to him and doeth it not, to him it is sin. I says, hey, you, you know what's good to do and you don't do it. Oh yeah, but I didn't, I didn't drink or smoke or cuss this week. Well, I'm glad you didn't do wrong. I'm glad you didn't do what was bad. But wait a minute, what did you do good? To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. John Wesley said, Do all the good you can, by all the means you can, and all the ways you can, and all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, for as long as you can. And I don't think I could say that again. Wow. Do good. That's all. Just do good. So I'm not just saying, hey, okay, I didn't do evil. I didn't say anything harmful. I didn't say anything I shouldn't say. All right. Did you say something good? Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Okay, I don't say anything bad. Oh, no, no. The verse doesn't stop there. But that which is good to the use of edifying. You know what it is? Say something good that it may minister grace to the hearer. What's grace? Yeah, undeserved favor. You say, well, they don't deserve me to say anything good about them. That's why you should, because that's grace. Are we graceful in our speech? Will we say something good even though someone may not deserve it? That's grace. Seasoned with grace. So I control the tongue, I eschew evil, I do good. And then the Bible says, back in 1 Peter chapter 3, it says, let him seek peace and ensue it. Live peaceably. Live peaceably. In Romans chapter 12, and verse number 18, the Bible says, if it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Romans 14, verse 19. Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace, and things wherewith one may edify another. Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who keep peace. A little girl said, Mommy, I was a peacemaker today. And her mother looked at her and said, Well, how was that? And the little girl said, I heard something and I didn't tell it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Don't, don't be the cause of contention or strife. Don't be the cause of division. Be the peacemaker. You may not get everybody to be at peace with you, but you can be at peace with them. Strive for peace. When it seems to be slipping away, the Bible says, that's what it means when it says seek peace and ensue it. Pursue it. And can I remind you that you'll never gain peace of mind by giving someone a piece of yours. Okay. Duke University did a study, actually did a study on peace of mind. And what they found that contributed to the emotional and mental stability of those who said they had peace of mind were these things. Number one, the absence of suspicion and resentment. Nursing a grudge was a major factor in unhappiness. Number two, not living in the past. An unwholesome preoccupation with old mistakes and failures led to depression and unhappiness. Think, when did I? I, I brought a radio message about that sometime, didn't I? Was it Don't Look Back? When, when is that? Has that already happened? Oh, it already happened? Okay. I, I don't remember what's happening and what's still ahead, so I, I have to ask that. You ought to listen to that if you haven't listened to it. I don't know what day it was, but 
but I think it's don't look back, but it's not, not living in the past. And by the way, we, we sometimes look in the past and we just live, live over those failures all over again, or those mistakes all over again. And whenever you have something that's begun to heal and it begins to get a scab on it, it's a healing process is, is taking place, and you want to pick at it and open it up again, what happens? That all begins to bleed again, doesn't it? It can hurt all over again, just like it did before. Number three, they said they found that what robbed people of their peace of mind was, or what gave people their peace of mind was not wasting time and energy fighting conditions you cannot change. They said you must cooperate with your circumstances instead of trying to run away from them. In other words, people who always, always are looking at how, how rough it is, how hard it is, how hard I have it, how difficult I have it, how nobody understands me, nobody knows what I'm going through, nobody lives like I have to live, nobody, I don't have this and I don't have that and I don't want this. Nobody ever talks that way with a smile on their face. Nobody ever talks that way and says, man, isn't life great? Now again, these aren't, Duke University is not a Christian organization, okay? Understand this. They said the next reason that people have their peace of mind is they refuse to indulge in self-pity when life hands them a raw deal. Accept the fact no one gets through life without some sorrow and misfortune. Now we understand this as believers. There's no such thing as misfortune. Okay? Nobody, no such thing as, well, that's just some bad luck. You think, you think God looks down at your life or my life and says, wow, look what happened to them. Do you think he looked down this morning, Tony, and said, wow, look at that dead battery. How about that? Huh? No. You know what? God, God knows all about it. God knows everything. That's ha- God knows what you're going to meet tomorrow morning. You don't know yet. I don't know yet. But God already knows. We, we say, oh my, or uh-oh, God never does. He's in control. We have to accept that. And, and Jesus, you know, it's interesting. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah said Jesus in Isaiah 53 was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And Jesus only lived 33 years on this earth. Do you think you're going to live 70 and not have any sorrows or grief? We get, we get a little bit of sorrow, a little bit of grief. God, why, why is this happening to me? Lord, what's going on? Why? We get all upset. Do you really think we should get through without any sorrow or grief? Who are we? They said the ones who had peace of mind cultivated the old-fashioned virtues of love, humor, compassion, and loyalty. Some Bible virtues there. It's interesting, they did find, the last thing they mentioned was this. Find something bigger than yourself to believe in. Even they had to acknowledge the people who have peace of mind had something bigger than themselves to focus on. Maybe that's why, maybe that's why Isaiah 26 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, for he trusteth in thee. When you focus your mind on God, self centered people scored the lowest in any test measuring happiness. Because you're just thinking about yourself. Seek peace and ensue it. You want to love life and see good days? Control your tongue. Eschew evil. Run away from evil. Do good. Seek peace and ensue it. 
Verse 12, remember God's care. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open under their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Remember God's care. We're continually under God's notice and God's care. We're not only under His notice and under His care. Hey, i got news for you. You're under God's protection. Wherever I go, He's there. Whatever I need, He can supply. He's made that promise. In the 1800's, there was a poor black woman who earned her living by hard daily labor but she was a joyous, triumphant Christian. Ah, Nancy, said a gloomy Christian lady to her one day, it's well enough for you to be happy now, but I should think the thoughts of the future would sober you. Only suppose, for instance, you should have a spell of sickness and be unable to work. Or suppose your present employer should move away and no one else should give you something to do. Or suppose, oh stop, said Nancy. I never supposes. The Lord is my shepherd, and I know I shall not want. And honey, she added to her gloomy friend, it's dim supposes that is making you so miserable. You better give them all up and just trust the Lord. And boy, isn't that true? How many times has the supposings or the what-ifs got us all discouraged and got us depressed Most of the things that that, that rob us of our joy and take away our happiness and keep us from loving life never happen. We just wonder what if they do. And they never happen. The believer is joyful. But I never saw a joyful supposer. I never saw a joyful what ifer. Sometimes we look to God to take care of us and supply for our need and we're prone to to, to think about what He has to work with. But think for a minute. Is it necessary for God to have anything to work with? Think about that. God created the heavens and the earth. What did He make them out of? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. When the earth was made, what did He hang it on? Nothing. He hangs the world on nothing. Not a scrap of anything was used to make it. Well, if God can make the earth and the sun and the moon and the stars and all that we see in creation, and He can make it out of nothing and keep them hanging on nothing and sustain them on nothing, do you think He can supply your needs whether there's anything to work with or not? He sure can. Trust Him. He'll see you through. Even if He has to make your supplies out of nothing. So how's God going to take care of me? I don't have anything. That's just what God specializes in. He specializes in making something out of nothing. Then He ends it by saying, The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open unto their prayers. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. You not only have the notice of God and the protection of God and the provision of God, hey, as believers, we have the ear of God. He's listening for our prayers. If you want to love life and you want to see good days and you want to say, man, I'm I'm enjoying living for God, then you must, you must, you must pray. If you don't pray, you'll never love life. You'll not see good days. You have to be a praying Christian. His ear is open to you. Does He hear from you? The the admonition in the Bible is to pray without 
ceasing. Yes, I know. Listen, there are times when Jesus, the disciples would know where Jesus was when they couldn't find Him. They knew when Judas, when they said, where are we going to find Jesus when they wanted to betray Him? Jesus, they said, Judas knew the place. He knew where He'd be. He knew He'd go to the garden. He knew He prayed there. And Jesus would rise a great while before day. Early in the morning, He'd go to a solitary place and there He'd pray. He had a place to pray. And, and you ought to have a place to pray. But you can't stay there all day praying. You have things to do. So when He says pray without ceasing, it must mean I've got to keep an ongoing conversation with God. All day long. Don't, don't get in the idea that, well, I go to my prayer closet, I go to my place and I pray, and then when I get up, I don't talk to God again and I go back and talk to Him again in the prayer time. No, 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 no. It's, it's the old, uh, some of you young people won't get this, but there used to be a time when phones hung on a wall. I know you don't believe it, but they did. And, and, and they even had a cord on them. You couldn't go very far. And, and if you wanted to go further, you could buy a longer cord. Remember when those first come up? You know what I mean? And, then, and sometimes you get kinked up, you have to hang it up and let it spin around, you know, and unwind. And what happened is you'd, you'd talk to somebody on the phone, but you had things to do, so what did you do? You'd cradle that phone in, in, in your ear like that. Hmm? And you'd go ahead and you'd do things and you'd keep on talking. That's what you do in the morning. You get God on the phone. And then you cradle the phone. And you take them with you all day long. And as you're driving down the road, you pray. And as you go about your duties at work, you pray. And as you, you, you have needs that come up or conversations you have or uh, the Lord opens opportunities for you to witness, you're asking God and you're talking to Him the whole time. God, help me. God, give me the words to say here. Lord, give me the opportunity. And you're praying without ceasing. Praying is that ongoing conversation with God. If you view prayer and begin to understand prayer as a conversation with God, you don't, you don't have to end your prayer. Just keep on going. You don't have to worry about the certain words you're going to use. You don't have to remember to pray about something. You just, you're still in prayer. You just pray. I remember reading the, about Billy Sunday and his wife would say oftentimes she wouldn't know if he was talking to her or to God. Because they'd be walking down the street and having a conversation and then all of a sudden he'd be say something that wouldn't make any sense to her and he'd look over and he wasn't looking at her. He was, looking, he was just looking up there talking to God. That was, that was praying without ceasing. Just keeping the line open. You see, when you find yourself in a difficult situation, it shouldn't be, well, I should have prayed for protection this morning. No, you should be praying right now for protection. You should be in prayer right now. Pray without ceasing. Continue to pray. Jesus said men ought always to pray and not to faint. Don't get weary in praying. It, it, really, it really helps you. If you know that the Lord, His ears are open to their prayers. But it's interesting how it ends, isn't it? Verse 12, But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. We end up right back where we started. That you control your tongue from speaking evil. God said if you do that, my face is against you. Then my ear is not open to your prayer. Wow. You want to love life? You want to, you want to see good days? Here's what he says. Control your tongue. Stay away from evil. Do good. Live peaceably. Remember God's care. Pray without ceasing. That's the formula. And it's right there in the Word of God for us to know. I don't know about you, I'm in, in January, I'll turn 60. I know, a gasp goes through the crowd. I, honestly, I can't believe that. I don't feel a day over 59. But, uh, but you know what? I, I'm determined 
that I'm going to love life. I, I, I may not make 60. I may drop dead tomorrow. I don't know. But I want to love life. I want to see good days. I don't want to, I don't want to be a, 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 a complaining, bitter, suspicious, evil speaking old guy. I want to love life. I want to see good days. Life's, life's too short. It's only a vapor. It appears for a little time and vanishes away. Let's love life. It ought to be somewhere where people can come and be around people and just say, man, those people just love life. They love serving God. They, they love the life God's given to them. And that's an attraction because most people are not in that situation. Try it. Try, try tomorrow, everywhere you go, smile at somebody. You'd be, you'd be amazed how sometimes I've, I've walked people, walking down the street, Brother Bob, sometimes, you know, you're, you're downtown. I think some of the others work downtown. A lot of people coming and going. I've tried to look, I've tried to zero in on people, laser their eyes out, you know, and smile at them. And boy, sometimes they'll do their best. They'll, they want to look the other way. But several times recently, I've, I've caught people's attention. I smile at them. You know what they do? They smile back. They smile back. It may be the only time they smile all day. I don't know. But I've determined, why don't, why don't you make it to where, you know what, I'm going to do my best to have people smile at me tomorrow and put a smile on their face. They're going to run into somebody who says, that guy, that lady, loves life and sees a good day. You've all had people say it to you. You get them checking out, have a good day. Maybe you'll say, you know, I just heard a message about that. No, you don't have to preach the message. Today. But I'm going to love life, and I'm going to see good days. Amen? Let's follow the admonition. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, take the truth now this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the plainness of the Bible, the simplicity of your word. Thank you, Lord, that you spelled this out. And, Lord, it's interesting to me how these admonitions come on the heels of you talking to wives and husbands. Lord, I suppose it means if we cannot love life and see good days at home with those who are closest to us, we'll never do it outside of our home. And so, Lord, help our Christianity to be good at home. Help us now tonight, Lord, to realize knowing this will not help us to love life and see good days. Doing it will. And Lord, we cannot do it on our own. The arm of our flesh will fail us. We must have your help. We ask for your power, for your grace, your sufficiency for our insufficiency to live what we've learned tonight. Lord, I pray there'll be numbers of people in the room who would say, I'm only 25, I'm only 30, I'm only 35, I'm only 17, I'm only uh, 40, but I'm going to love life. I'm going to see good days. I'm going to follow these admonitions, these instructions that have been given me. This is the formula. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put God to the test and see if I won't love life and see good days by following what he's told me to do here in 1 Peter chapter 3. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I'll finish praying here in just a moment, but I wonder how many folks tonight would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God stopped at my seat. He ministered to my heart tonight. I want to love life. I want to see good days. I understand that some of the things you mentioned and some of the things Peter brought out tonight, I see where that's been robbing me of enjoying my life and seeing the good days I'd like to see. But with God's help, with Him enabling me, I'm going to live out the Bible I've learned this evening. 
I want people to look at me and I want them to say they're in, they are loving life. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Will you put your hand up, Christian, and say pray for me tonight? Amen. Amen. That's good. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'll pray and we'll have our invitation. The Lord has spoken to your heart. Respond to him this evening. Just bow the knee and say, Lord, I want to love life. I want to see good days. For some, it'll be just laying the tongue on the altar, saying, God, I need help. Let me say that which is good. Don't let me, Lord, deliver me from evil. Some, it's praying without ceasing. Some, it's realizing that God is noticing. He watches over you. He'll provide for you. He'll care for you. Trust Him. However it is that God has dealt with your heart, respond to Him this evening. Heavenly Father, thank You for speaking to hearts tonight. I pray, Lord, Your will will be done under invitation. Lord, I pray that as a result of us spending time in this passage this evening, it'll make a difference in many people's lives. And it will have a ripple effect out into many other people's lives as they see the joy of the Lord in us, as they see that Jesus has given us life and he's given it to us more abundantly. Please meet with us now during this invitation and I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, you stand to your feet. As you stand to your feet, the pianist will play. She plays, Brother Bob's going to sing. The altar is open. You respond to the Lord tonight. Will you please? Oh, soul, are you That's weary right. and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant. Amen. And free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Through death into life everlasting. Past and we follow him there. Over us sin no more hath dominion, for more than conquerors we are. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow. Strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. His word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying, his perfect salvation to tell. Sing the chorus with him, will you? Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Father, thank you for a wonderful day today. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Thank you, Father, for a wonderful weekend and the men's breakfast and those who did the decorating here. And, uh, Lord, we're, we're grateful for a wonderful service this morning and now this evening. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to leave this place and live the, the Bible truths that we've been reminded of today. Lord, we want to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We want others to see Christ in us. Father, I pray your blessing on the activities of the week. I pray for the ladies' meeting tomorrow night. 
Pray for the meeting Wednesday night with Brother Dobbins. Pray for the, the children's practice Saturday and our visits and soul winning we'll make and then the next Sunday services and right on through with the Christmas dinner and, and all the activities that go on during this time of year. Lord, I pray that we'll just determine we're going to love life and see good days. Lord, it will be like our Savior and just determine we're going to go about doing good. We'll not be overcome of the evil in this world, but we'll overcome the evil with good. Help us, enable us to do so. And I pray others will be drawn to Christ because of it. And I pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget, if you need to get signed up for the Christmas dinner, see Carol Coleman. And uh, ladies, if you haven't signed up yet, get your name on the list down there for the meeting tomorrow night. Uh, it looks like it's going to be a great, great time. Okay? Let's sing It's a Grand Thing to Be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Let's hear you sing it. Hey, it's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. It's a grand thing to follow Jesus. Anywhere and everywhere I go for it's a grand thing to be a soldier in his army here below. It's the grandest thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. God bless you. You are dismissed.